Well, as you're coming in, um, Dr. Wesselman's passing out. There's a brief myths and facts little questionnaire we're going to have you guys do. So we can take a few minutes to determine whether or not each of those statements are true or false. And if someone doesn't have one, let me know. Yeah, go ahead and get us started for the, for the sake of time. Go ahead and get us started. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. You guys, if you're not done, you can continue to do that. I just wanted to introduce ourselves. I am Dr. Leandra Paris, and this is my colleague, Dr. Eric Wesselman. We're both from Illinois State University in the psychology department. I'm going to be over here so I can... <laughs> um, so you have your survey, and we're going to come back to that at the end of the presentation, so hold on to those. First thing that I always like to do is just kind of go over what bullying is, and I know most of you probably have a pretty good understanding of that. But we always look for a couple of different things when we're trying to identify bullying. One is that the behavior is repeated. It's intentional, so the student is intentionally trying to cause distress or harm or threaten someone. And there's usually some sort of power differential. So Dr. Bean actually referenced that in his opening speech this morning that the person may be physically or socially more powerful. What we've started talking about in the literature is maybe it's not necessarily a power struggle, but an attack on agency. So you're trying to take someone else's power from them. We find that students who engage in bullying behaviors may actually be trying to regain some control. So they're trying to take other people's power and resources in order to alleviate their own symptomology. And we find that about half of students are involved in some way, either as a victim, as a bully, or a bully victim. And bully victims tend to not be discussed quite as much, but they actually are at great risk, even more so than just solely being a victim or solely being a bully. And on average, we would say about 35% of students are being victimized in some form. Now, there are a lot of different types of bullying. There's physical bullying, hitting, kicking, that kind of thing. There's also verbal, which is you know, name calling, threatening. In today's presentation, we decided to focus on relational bullying. There's a couple of reasons why. Relational bullying is a little bit different. It's harder to see. Some examples would be spreading rumors, social exclusion, isolating someone off. So the story he told about his son eating by himself in the lunchroom, that's a common form. And the goals typically are to humiliate the victim, take away part of their social status, use their control to influence their social standing, and remove friendships. And we see this being really complicated, especially when we have the frenemy situation. So a lot of times it's someone who is your friend, someone you consider to be close to you, who's spreading rumors or somehow influencing your social circles. So a couple of effects. Um, we see that they have increased risk of fear and psychological restraint. So these are your friends bullying you 
and they're turning people against you, it's hard for you to reach out for support. So they start to feel they don't have that freedom to attend to their psychological needs. We also find that PTSD symptoms are just as prevalent in students who only experience relational aggression. This is not just a physical thing. Increased anxiety, depression, and increased social isolation, usually just through the means of being relationally bullied. Another thing that we like to sort of talk about in relationship to indirect forms is cyberbullying. This would be threatening text messages, unwanted posts, spreading conversations. You guys all heard the case of the Rutgers case where they posted videos of inappropriate things about their fellow friends. And the goals here are still to affect social status or to manipulate situations in the real world, to have a real world tie over. And the reason we talk about it together with relational is that even though cyberbullying has been shown to be very different, Students who engage in cyberbullying morally are different. They have different personality traits. They have different coping mechanisms. It still has the same goals. The effects are very similar. And it's also compounded by the fact that victims of traditional bullying tend to be perpetrators of cyberbullying. So you have this very complex dynamic of kids who are experiencing face-to-face -face bullying and then going online and bullying others. So there's one form of relational bullying that we wanted to touch base on today, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Eric Wesselman. He's going to tell you a little bit more about ostracism. Good morning. Um, we'll switch microphones here in a second uh, while you're going through this little activity here. Um, what uh, we're going to do uh, is uh, look at the, break you up into groups of three. Um, I usually do this in a traditional classroom, which is why I have the rows. Uh, so it's going to go three, 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 and three. Um, um, what's going to happen is I'm going to give you instructions. They're going to be labeled one, two, three. It's going to be a role play. Um, what are the instructions? Look at it. Uh, it's got your number on it. Don't show it to your partners. Um, and then after you've read your instructions, um, we're going to do the first initial stage of it based on the instructions that you have for a couple minutes. And then uh, in your instructions, it tells you that at some point in time, the second stage will begin when I say, Next stop, Eastern. So I'll tell you when the second stage begins, and then you follow the directions for the second stage. I'll go on for a few minutes, and then we'll discuss the activity. So there's uh, your three paper books. Everybody has a chance to read your instructions? Okay, all right, so go ahead and begin. Huh? Question. Yeah. Is this specific to bullying? Hmm? Is, the, is this specific to No, no, this is just to have a conversation. Okay. Just general. <laughs> just general question, so. Okay, so go ahead and begin your first stage. This, yeah.
well, I Oh, cool. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, next stop, Eastern. Begin your second stage now. Because hmm? where it is, the, the traditional version of it was set at the school that it was at. It's supposed to be a train. <laughs> I, supposed to be, I think I, I went quickly because we were running behind and I yeah. forgot about that. They're supposed to pretend like they're sitting next to people on a train and, okay. sorry, and have a conversation about what they did over oh, the weekend. This is Eastern Illinois. Yes. Yeah, uh -huh. see, yeah. The original versions of that had it, all of that in the instructions. I think I tried to cut it down for time oh, and I just forgot about yeah. it. <laughs> Usually I do this in a 50 minute class, just yeah. this is like the first 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I think being a little late, I feel like, like what? Yeah. Um, take time because I can go through the intervention. Okay. Um, Okay, we've uh, been about five minutes, so uh, who was number three in each of your groups? Okay, so uh, those of you who are number threes, um, why don't you uh, say to the group basically what happened to you during this role play? Anyone? Who's number three? Okay, so you were three, so uh, what did you experience during your role play? Okay, you're mostly listening, and why is that? I don't know. Okay, okay. Anyone else? Any other number three? Yeah. I was ostracized. You were ostracized. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about how that played out. Well, we have been speaking intensely, and, and I had a question. Mm -hmm. So the question was not answered, and I was ignored. Okay, all righty. Ah, interesting, interesting. So, um, so let's let's stick with that. I imagine the other number threes probably had similar, but we can come back to you in a second. I want to want to stick with this. You turned your you turned your chair away from her. Why why did you do that? Well, it's kind of the point, but I thought it was bad. Okay, all right. 
So your instructions, number one and number two, were instructed to not pay attention to number three at all after the second stage started. And so she asked you a question, and, and so you did something the instructions didn't tell you to do to, in, in facilitation. Why did you pick that behavioral response? Um, I felt like it was a nonverbal cue to kind of let her know that her questions and her input were <laughs> Right, right, yeah. So there's something nonverbal about this. Not even acknowledging. You, you said the word ignored. That's important. Um, we'll open it up now to either the sources of ostracism or the targets of ostracism. Any other thoughts you had during the experience? Yeah. I'm number one. And okay. Even though I'm just sitting in this order. Mm. And because uh, I was sitting over there mm. earlier. And I had to apologize to her immediately after it was over because I am not good at ignoring people. <laughs> and that's important. That keys off what, what you said as well, right? You felt bad. You had to apologize. A any other feel? I'm seeing some nods. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? I felt that my duty to ignore her lately. I still made some eye contact and an occasional <laughs> nod just because of the awkward. <laughs> <laughs> awkward. <laughs> Exactly, awkward. It's difficult, right? And so um, what we're not talking about, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please, um, is this phenomena that um, we call ostracism. Now, I'm a social psychologist. My PhD training uh, was focusing mostly on understanding the dyna dynamics of ostracism. And there are two sides to understanding ostracism. There's the experiences of it, and there's also the uses of it, and both are very complicated. I've done research on both. I'm going to focus mostly on the experience of it today. Now, you all engaged in a role play exercise, right? So essentially, you were following, you were being obedient to my instructions. I was requiring you to ignore and exclude another person. And when you're simply doing it without sufficient motivation, right, you're doing it because you're obeying me, that feels very differently than doing it because you want to. Right, and, that, and that's, that, that's very important. Uh, this all comes down to the idea of what our, um, uh, Dr. Bean earlier said, um, that you know, we have this need to belong, almost a biological need. And that's actually uh, very, uh, very poignant. A lot of researchers have looked at this need to belong and its psychological and its physical uh, implications, both when it's satisfied and when it's thwarted. Right? We are social beings by nature. Uh, Matt Lieberman just wrote a book called Social, How We're Hardwired to Connect with Others, where he talks about this need for social connection, this drive, is something that's inherent. And we have to work very hard to deal with it when we don't get that. And we have to be sufficiently motivated to behave in ways that are contrary to that particular interaction. Right? So you turned your body and it still felt bad to not give people that interaction. Right? So, so we are inherently social. And that's sort of where we start with understanding ostracism. Um, ostracism, the word colloquially, gets used in a lot of different ways. Um, it's something that we all kind of intuitively get when we hear the word. Uh, we've all probably experienced it at least once in our life. Some of us experience it more regularly. Um, and we have many other colloquial terms for it, the cold shoulder, the silent treatment, um, being shunned, <coughs> um, being left out. Uh, and in the psychological research, we define it conceptually as being ignored and excluded, right? The terms exclusion, rejection, and ostracism are often used synonymously, and they're related, but there are some conceptual differences, right? So I could go around and invite all of you out for drinks afterwards, right? I can say, hey, come for drinks, come for drinks, you don't come for drinks. Come for drinks, come for drinks, come for drinks, you don't come for drinks, right? Or I could completely skip over you two. Right? So in a, being rejected or excluded oftentimes involves a direct sort of communication that you're not wanted. But ostracism has an added implication to it. It's treating you as if you don't exist. You're not even worth the time, in some cases, to communicate. And we'll talk a little bit about the dynamics of this non-behavior, if you will. Um, uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So when we talk about exclusion, bullying, rejection, and ostracism, these all fall under a, a rather larger umbrella called social pain. Now, I know we're all here for the same reasons. We want to talk about bullying and those sorts of phenomena, so we don't really need to be convinced that it's harmful. But if you've ever tried to talk to this with the general public, you know that many of them don't quite get it at the same way, right? You've heard the phrase probably at least once, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never hurt you, 
right? Well, we know from the psychological literature and other areas that actually these sorts of things do hurt, right? We could just think about um, how um, when people try to describe these things, you ask victims, they say things like, you know, this broke my heart, I was stabbed in the back, you know, my feelings were hurt, right? And this isn't just colorful hyperbole, right? Um, I'm missing my remote. <laughs> Go ahead and click yeah. that. Um, for, uh, there is evidence to suggest that at both the neurological and the phenomenological level that these things, uh, these types of social threats actually are experienced as pain. So at the, the, the top picture, um, uh, my PhD advisor and some of his colleagues back in the early 2000s uh, published a paper in Science where they put people in an fMRI scanner. Right? And we've identified as scientists what areas of the brain are active when we get physically injured. So if you had me in a scanner and Leander came over here and punched me, you'd see those areas light up. You also put me in a scanner and put me through a manipulation of ostracism or rejection or some other type of social threat, you see those same areas light up, the ones that are associated with physical pain. Um, and then here's another study where um, uh, one of my colleagues took this pain, the universal pain slide, often used in medical research, and just asked people, you know, how much pain are you feeling right now? You know, it's something that's meant to communicate cross language, cross ages, um, and you feel, you see that people who are um, ostracized or excluded in other ways indicate feeling some amount of pain. What's also interesting about social pain, though, when you compare it to physical pain, is that social pain can be relived. Once again, our keynote speaker earlier today talked about the individual uh, who um, said that he would basically ruminate at night on his experiences and felt like it was happening all over again. And there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that does happen with social pain, right? So if I were to uh, have you think about a your, the worst physical pain episode in your life and the worst social pain, and then give you this slide and ask you how you felt then and how you feel now, right? You may say that, oh yeah, when I had this compound fracture, that was a 10, right? And I can say, how are you feeling now? Well, you don't re-experience that in the same way. You'll be down here at zero. But if I ask you to relive your worst social pain, and you say, oh, my significant other from high school, when we graduated, I found out that person had been cheating on me for four years, right? And that would have been 10. Now I ask you, how are you feeling right now? And you wouldn't say a 10 again necessarily, but you might be here in the medium, right? So this concept of getting in and breaking open old wounds, right, once again, is not just colorful metaphor. There's empirical evidence to suggest that, yes, we can at some level relive these things as we ruminate on them. Um, in addition to pain, ostracism and some of these uh, related phenomena <laughs> um, also uh, threaten psychological needs, we've already talked about the need to belong, it lowers our self-esteem, it lowers our feelings of control and meaningful existence. Things that we all know in psychology as sort of core psychological needs. And if those things are continually thwarted, they lead to chronic negative outcomes. Feelings of alienation, feelings of depression, learned helplessness as we saw in our speaker earlier today, um, and feelings of just general overall meaninglessness, nihilism. Um, and in the most extreme cases, you see people hurting themselves or others. And what's powerful about ostracism, uh, so my, my advisor, when he started doing the early work on this, he did a lot of qualitative interviews with people who've experienced it for long periods of time, people who have used it. He had a married couple who came in who hadn't talked to each other for 10 years. They lived in the same house and they just didn't speak. And one of the questions about uh, why ostracism was used so prominently in this household is that it's tough to substantiate. It's a non-behavior. Someone punches you, you can show a bruise. Someone posts nasty things about you on the internet. There's a digital paper trail. But try to prove that someone isn't acknowledging you. It's a lot harder. The most common way to study this experimentally, right, as a, psycho as a psychological scientist, I'm interested in cause and effect statements, um, we randomly assign people in a very simple game uh, called Cyberball, um, where uh, we wanted to sort of figure out how minimally can we make the situation and still bother people, um, essentially still induce ostracism. Um, so participants come into a lab and uh, they get on a computer and they're told you're going to play with other people. Uh, over our network. Uh, we don't tell them where, we just say these are the people. And this is a mental visualization exercise. Okay, so the goal here is not the ball toss, and the goal is to really practice thinking about what's going on here. Imagine what the weather might be like, imagine what the other players are like, etc. Are you throwing a round of football or a basketball or whatever? 
In the inclusion condition, these in reality, of course, are computer programmed. This is based off of an actual live interaction that they, they started with and they moved to a computer version. Um, they are programmed to throw the ball equally to one another and to the participant. And this can go on for 30 tosses, 50 tosses, 100 tosses if you want. In the um, uh, ostracism condition, though, they are programmed to give the ball once a piece to the participant to demonstrate that, that they can. And then for the remainder of the game, it just goes back and forth. Once again, no matter how long you want the game to go. And people pick up on this really quickly. Usually after a couple cycles, you know, they're like, hey, wait a minute. You know, I've actually seen participants, college participants get aggressive in the lab. Uh, my favorite is we actually had a hidden camera on one person and we, we noticed like this entire trajectory. He started laughing nervously. Then he scowled and he flipped off the camera. And then he sat there like this for the remainder of the time. I mean, it was just, scientifically, it's a beautiful demonstration. <laughs> um, <coughs> Your body yeah. language changed, mm -hmm. you guys kind of did this. You actually leaned back at one point mm -hmm. away from everyone. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point out that it, there are nonverbal cues that we can tell right away. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Um, so now this is a very powerful demonstration and it's minimal for a reason. We want as tight a control as possible. Um, we want to manipulate the information that people get. Right? And so uh, even something as simple as this basic game bothers people. Right? The picture I showed you with the fMRI scan, this was the paradigm that they were using. Um, and it's, uh, it's very, uh, what's nice about it is that it's, it's, it's very easy to use. You can download it from, for free from my advisor's website. Um, and you can, just, you can collect data online. They've collected this, 150 different published papers. People across the world have used this, various different academic disciplines. Uh, there have been versions of uh, the instructions that we use that people have translated them into various different languages. Um, and uh, also it works, once again, I've seen developmental psychologists use it in children as young as five and as old as people in their 80s, right? And so it's, it's a very nice tool in that way. Um, uh, I think I've said all I want to say about this. I can always uh, move on. I'm used to giving a longer talk on this. Uh, if you could click to the next one, things. Yes, thank you. So this is one of the more common ways that we've studied ostracism in my advisor's lab and in, in my lab since graduating. Um, there are other areas that they've created. So the version that I showed you, cyberball, is considered cyber ostracism. It's being ignored and excluded in a cyber setting. But you could have physical ostracism, for example. Um, what you just experienced in your, uh, in your role play was physical ostracism, you were in the physical presence of other people. They've done other versions of this using different types of social networking and e-based communication. Chat rooms, text messages. Recently I, I saw a, a paper come out uh, that I was very impressed by that created their own version of Facebook uh, just for the lab. And they showed that not only do people who dispositionally feel lonely put posts out there in a, to get likes, that's very subtle social communication. But if you put something out there and you don't get likes, in terms of manipulation, you show the same feelings of ostracism. Right? I put this post out there and no one says anything. I feel similarly to how you do in all of these other paradigms. So this all comes back to the idea that we are tuned to minimal cues of social inclusion. Um, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and what's interesting is that when this work first started out, a lot of people would say, well, it's just a computer game, surely it wouldn't hurt when dot 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 dot. Well that basically got my advisor tenure because he said fine, I'll test that. And he kept testing all of these things and lo and behold in all these different situations it was very hard to find situations where people weren't bothered by these different ostracism paradigms. For example, <coughs> it doesn't really matter who the social group is. Whether it's a member of your in-group or your out-group it still bothers you. Now it bothers you more when it's a member of your in-group but even if it's someone you don't normally associate with, you still don't like it. Take that one step further. My advisor back when he was in Australia uh, did a paper where he called the KKK won't let me play. <laughs> where he took a hated out group and he had people play with political in groups, political out groups, or members of the KKK, or they thought they were. And even when it was the KKK, people actively said, I don't want to associate with them. It still bothered them when they were ostracized. They replicated that at a Howard University, a historically black institution. The majority of the participants were African American. Knowing going in, when they saw the avatars, that was a gigantic burning cross and a KKK symbol, right? Still bothered them. Um, 
Even if you tell people that it's just a computer, if I tell you in advance this computer is programmed to behave this way towards you, it still bothers people at least immediately. Um, some uh, participants in their debriefing said, well, <laughs> the computer should serve us. You know, why does the computer hate me? Right, there's anthropomorphism going on here. Um, even when ostracism is beneficial, it still immediately bothers people. They've done versions of Cyberball where they did one called Euroball, uh, some of my colleagues in the Netherlands, where uh, they get, said people coming in, okay, we're going to give you 10 euro, right? Every ball toss costs money. You're going to get to walk out at the end with however many you have. So presumably, if you don't get the ball and you can't toss it back, you get more money when you leave, right? Doesn't moderate the effects. You still see these immediate pain, negative affect, need threats. Even the money doesn't seem to help. They had another version called Cyber Bomb, where they said at some point in time the bomb's going to go off and kill an avatar, whoever's holding it. Once again, you don't get the bomb, your character will be fine. People still don't like it. They said afterwards they would have rather been included with the chance of losing the game rather than just sitting there and being guaranteed to win. Now, what do we do about ostracism? And this is a little trickier because in the basic research literature, we've now hit the point where we know a lot about the phenomena, why it functions, but figuring out how to fix it is a whole other issue. Um, but I'll give you sort of a summary of what we have so far, what we know from the basic literature. Um, there's a phenomenon called social snacking, right? So think about times where you might have felt a little bit lonely. Maybe you reflected upon a good relationship that you had and it made you feel better. Right? Experimentally, we can do that. If we ostracize people, and then some of the people in the lab, we say, think about a close relationship. Right? A friend, a pet, a fictional character in a book. Reflect on their connection with their deity. Any of these types of social snacks help people recover better than people in the control conditions, who are just ostracized and told to sit there. So, th so reminding oneself of other social connections, at least momentarily, can help you recover. Um, simply distraction works. Uh, just having them think about a different task, those people re so recover more quickly than people who are allowed to ruminate on it. Um, there have been some research getting people to sort of think about different ways of cognitively reframing the event. So oftentimes when people get ostracized in our manipulations, they make both internal and external attributions. They're not given a lot of information as to why. So like, was it me? Was it them? WTF, right? Um, if you get them to, to sort of think about it from an outside perspective or to focus more on the other people and not so much of what they did, people recover a lot quicker. Um, and we find that giving people alternative options like Facebook or something like that to seek out other social connections can help people recover. Now the problem here is that when you get outside the lab, some people who are ostracized chronically in the real world, this online social interaction may be their last bastion of hope, right? So what happens for people who then become ostracized in that domain too. And unfortunately, we don't really have a lot at this stage about what that might look like. Um, so, but there are at least, in the lab, we have some basic things that could be useful towards creating intervention programs. Um, is that my last thing? Okay. I think I'm good for now, but if we have time for questions, I'm happy to pontificate more. Uh, so, I'll get back to Leander. Um, okay, so, Ugh, this is not my strong suit with the, yeah, okay. So one of the things that I do is I actually spend a lot of times working with teachers and educators and children in school systems. And so I just wanted to give you a couple of things that we've learned about what works when you're working with groups of students or if you're working in any sort of situation where you have um, teachers or school personnel, church leaders, that kind of thing. Oh, oh, sorry. I I, there we go. So the one thing that, is, that literature has really emphasized is that teacher emotional support. And I want to clarify that this isn't necessarily teacher intervention. A lot of students say, I don't want to tell my teacher because they're going to go back and say something to the bully. And then the bully's going to find out I said something. I don't want to tell the teacher because maybe she's not going to believe me. Or he's going to do something and it's just going to come back to make it worse. So what they really say is really beneficial is to have that one teacher who offers emotional support. Students who have chronic relational aggression, who have one teacher or counselor or youth minister or parent who offers that, that actually moderates their level of subsequent depression and anxiety. So even though they're still experiencing chronically, they're not as depressed, they're not as anxious, they're not as fearful. They don't have that same level. 
And again, to clarify, that's emotional support. So talking to them about how they feel, helping them problem solve ideas for ways that they can address the situation. And then if the student asks for your intervention, that's great. You can follow through with your school's policy or whatever system you're working within. But we tend to really emphasize that point. <laughs> Another interesting... <laughs> Another interesting finding is that when students are reaching out for support, relational aggression is hard because this is a social imbalance. How do you get social support if your social support is the thing hurting you? So they find that it's actually helpful for us to have situations where they're getting support from people outside of their peer group. Even if relational aggression isn't necessarily occurring within that group, having that sort of I don't know you, you don't really know me, I'm not personally invested in your well-being, but let's talk. So what we found is we get groups of girls and boys, gender specific usually, and they don't know each other usually. We just know that they all experience bullying at some sort. They may be from different grades, they may not be within the same social circles, and those groups tend to be more affected than the ones where we have groups of friends in the group together. So when I'm running groups with victims, or I'm working with students who are experiencing sort of a bully victim situation, I tend to try to not make the group homogenous socially. I want the football player, I want the violin player, I want the kid who's in chess club, I want them all in that together because they're talking to people who are not socially connected to them. There can be some risk of that if that happens to be their bully, so I'll so make sure that no one else in the group is their bully. That's important, I made that mistake once, don't do that. But the number one thing that we found worth is focusing on general climate. So most students say that, you know, what the bully does, that's his thing. What I do may or may not be effective, but the one thing that always works is someone standing up. So in the coffee shop, saying, you know what, she doesn't deserve that. It has more effect than if she had stood up for herself. Students are constantly saying, if one person would just say, this isn't okay. So we're actually seeing a big push to talk about bystander and I sorry, my tongue is swollen, slight allergy, so I'm tripping up a little bit. Um, they say that that intervention is more effective. So talking to kids about, is this what our school looks like? Is this what we do as a group? Are we going to let this be okay? This is the same thing for online situations. There's a great curriculum that talks about a positive online environment that classrooms and grade levels develop together to help them understand that I don't just, I'm not going to just walk out of this walk, you know, workshop right now. You all would be like, that is rude behavior. So why would I just walk out of a chat room? Why would I just shut you off? Why would I tell you that you're stupid without maybe following it up with it like, JK? No one knows that, right? So really talking about that lack of tone, that inability to detect sarcasm, sarcasm when we're online, and creating an overall supportive environment saying, if you're a victim, say something because it's safe to say something. We don't stand for this. And another big piece is empathy building. We do this early on as young as three and four year olds. And a lot of people think that empathy, oh, this is what I do with my bullies. These are the ones that are perpetrating. I'm teaching them how to walk in other people's shoes. But what we're found, we found is that victims actually benefit from that just as much. It helps them become an active bystander. And sometimes it helps them to break away from that situation and look at the bully and say, why do you feel the need to do this? Maybe this isn't about me. So that's really important, as Eric was talking about that cognitive restructuring, to have the empathy skills to begin with, both as a victim and as a bully. And we had a scenario we were going to go through, but we're a little short on time, so I think I would rather open up to any questions that you may have for me or for Eric about your presentation today. It is called, um, it's by Agustin and Limber, A-G-A-S-T-O-N, Limber, L-I-M-B-E-R, and Kowalski, K-O-W-A-L-S-K-I. And I don't remember the actual order, but I know those are the three authors. Um, it came out of Georgia, I think, and there's two different, there's a K through 5 and then a 6 through 12 curriculum, and it's literally called cyberbullying, anti-prevention program or something like that. Great lessons that can be used both in group format and in the classroom format. I have a friend who did her dissertation on it. She chose random 
homeroom classrooms at the middle school level and compared that. And over the course of a year, she saw a reduction in cyberbullying and an increase in cyber support in students who were exposed to the curriculum during homeroom. Once a month, that's all it took. Once a month for a year. Mm -hmm. So those are all part of the language you use to deal with emotional support. And, uh, so we train everybody in the school to provide emotional support. But you're right in terms of hope. Now everybody can establish good relationships with students. Right. So you need to, like you said, match them up to somebody who can. And it needs to be somebody. And uh, that's what reinforce your empowering the bystanders. Mm -hmm. That's critical. And all the research you just mentioned, you know, that's extremely powerful. But you've got to create that environment and empathy. You know, you talk about and I think it's, it's so important, especially for relational and ostracism, because the social power comes from feeding off others. They do this because they, they get other people's power. They turn their friends against you. They get people to talk about you. They're using social power. And in social situations, bystanders saying, no, you don't get that from me, is probably the most effective thing that you can say, is I'm not going to let you do this. Plus, I'm not going to let you manipulate the way I think about people. I'll make my own decision. And that's a really effective motto for our bystanders as well. So I think we're up time-wise, but yeah, go ahead. that they're basically not to acknowledge it unless they've seen it. Mm. And so what happens is kids have gone to teachers, told them what happened, including when they go to a group of their side of whatever happened, mm -hmm. or a couple of kids who, who emotionally support them. And the teacher still says, well, oh well. So I think that goes... It's not to report. Right, and I think that goes back to the emotional support piece. Teachers can still provide that empathy. Teachers can still say, I understand how hurtful this must be. And to talk to them about ways that they can then address that. But I do run into that sometimes where teachers feel they want to do something and they're bound by a lack of policy. So whenever I go to a new system, the first thing I always do is say, what's your bullying policy? And if you can't tell me what it is, we should have a conversation. That's very dangerous. <laughs> I've been involved in eight lawsuits. And if we find out that you knew you heard a rumor and you didn't investigate it, and now the kid's in the hospital, it, so yeah, it does we, become a. We have, we have a style, we have a process for investigating rumors without blaming people. But mm -hmm. it's important. You don't want to ignore this. But we also <laughs> acknowledge that it's also hard to prove. I mean, we've talked about that. It can be really. Yeah. And, and, and to get back to what you had mentioned, you know, if the teacher sees it, right? Well, in the case of, of ostracism, which can be very purposeful, prove that I'm actively acknowledging yeah. it, right? You know, I mean, a lot of the, uh, the early qualitative research said that, uh, or sh showed that uh, people said they did it because they could very easily pass it off. They'd be like, oh, I wasn't purposefully ignoring this person. Yeah. Yeah. They're being too yeah. sensitive. I didn't do that. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, thank you so much. You guys were great. And um, I know we gave you guys this. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we gave you guys the surveys. Um, if you see one you don't know the answer to after our presentation, feel free to ask. But you're more than welcome to keep those to take with you because those are things that kids have actually said to us. So just some things to think about.
We have a, a copy of an article up here that uh, one of our recent school science students uh, first authored. Uh, it's not stapled, unfortunately. The, uh, the copy placed in staple like we asked. But they did put some nice little orange dividers in there. <laughs> so feel free to take it. 